My name is Adam Stolberg, and I'm the uh, co-director of the Center for International Strategy, Technology, and Policy, and associate professor here at the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at, at Georgia Tech. And on behalf of both the school and the center, let me welcome you uh, to our event today, in which we are very thrilled to be able to host uh, the Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. And let me uh, note before I do the introductions that these are quite heady times uh, for her portfolio. Um, uh, on the one hand, all three strains on the nuclear ledger, that, those being related to arms control, nonproliferation, and global nuclear security, uh, sit atop the international security agendas, not, here, not only here in the United States, but worldwide. So not, these issues are no longer the stepchild of nuclear modernization and nuclear strategy uh, that were really the hallmarks of the, of the Cold War era. And as you well know, especially the students in our program, uh, know that we've made tremendous progress in reducing a lot of the hangover uh, from the Cold War, with 85 percent of the stockpiles reduced since the, the height of the Cold War period. And of course, uh, the signing of the New START Treaty uh, and the commitment to push those boundaries a little bit further with a, an additional one-third reduction in standing uh, strategic arsenals. Uh, and even some uh, talk again of uh, proceeding with ratification of the CTBTO. In other words, making progress on that future uh, vision uh, of the road to zero, which is a topic uh, that is near and dear to many of us who work in the field, not to mention the namesake of our school. Uh, on the other hand, as I mentioned, these are very complicated times for those uh, areas of nuclear uh, nonproliferation, arms control, and security. Uh, it seems that even before the outbreak of the crisis in Ukraine that uh, the bilateral arms control agenda with Russia uh, had stalled a bit. Um, and uh, there's been, uh, those of you who have been reading the newspapers, some acrimony over compliance issues of an age-old agreement, the 1987 uh, INF agreement, um, that our speaker actually is the point in, in trying to get to the bottom of. Uh, but other challenges persist. Uh, this is not a particularly uh, financially auspicious moment uh, to be thinking about uh, more spending in this area, even if that spending require, is related to reductions. Uh, so there are a lot of challenges both here at home uh, and abroad in trying to advance uh, the nuclear agenda. Uh, and so needless to say, there are rocky shoals in the sea of arms control uh, that confront uh, the global community on these issues. But I dare say that I'm delighted that our speaker is really the point person for navigating these shoals. Uh, the Honorable Rose Gottmuller, who is the current Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, uh, who is actually charged with advising the Secretary of State on these issues, uh, really brings a wealth of knowledge, experience, and integrity uh, to this challenge. Previously, she served as Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Arms Control Verification and Compliance. She was also the Chief Negotiator of the New START Treaty with uh, Russia. Uh, she is a Russia slash Soviet hand, uh, can, uh, has the scars to show it, uh, and is really uh, brings, like I said, a tremendous amount of integrity. And on a personal note, um, I feel like my career has really been in her, in her shadows ever since I uh, entered graduate school because at the same time I worked at a place called the Rand Corporation where she also was working there. And so throughout my career she has been able to provide uh, practical insights into, and correctives to my theoretical musings, so I appreciate that uh, along the way. Um, and also I must say, and I, and I must note that, as I, and I was sort of tongue-in-cheek about the, the challenges that we face in arms control today, but there are real challenges. And one has to do with this compliance issue of the INF Treaty with Russia, and um, Rose Gottemuller is really, as I mentioned, the point person in doing that. And I can really think of no better person at this moment to deal with such a difficult issue uh, because not only does she bring integrity and respect here in the, across the aisle in the United States, but she is really respected widely in those increasingly narrow circles of the strategic community in, in Russia. Uh, so we're very fortunate not only to be able to host her talk today, but to have her at the point in these very heady times. So please, without further ado, let me turn it over. You know, it's, uh, it's really great to be here at Georgia Tech today, and uh, I've already had a fantastic morning 
uh, talking with, uh, with so many of both the students but also the professors here and learning a lot about the work that you are doing in precisely the areas that interest me so much. So I'd say, Adam, throughout our careers it's actually been not so much you in my shadow, but I think it's been a mutual admiration uh, society of the practitioner for what is going on on the academic side and, uh, I, well, I hope vice versa. But anyway, I'm going to speak to you today very much as a practitioner and uh, hope uh, to highlight for you some of the thinking I have about how our practice of arms control and diplomacy can improve over time and policy making in this important arena and I'm hoping very much uh, with your help. So I am going to talk about uh, arms control as I see it in the information age, but I wanted to start out by setting the stage a little bit. Uh, because of the work of people uh, in this field at a very senior level, including Senator Nunn, who is here with us today, but also, of course, President Reagan and Secretary Schultz, Perry, and Kissinger, President Obama in this administration, we have actually come a long way in achieving nuclear disarmament. At its peak in 1967, the U.S. arsenal was comprised of 31,255 nuclear weapons. I like the phrase that Carl Sagan used when he said, we and the Soviets were waist deep in gasoline with some 60,000 matches between us. It was a very, very dangerous era in the late 1960s. But three years later, the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, came into force. The NPT plays a central role in our pursuit of a nuclear weapons-free world, and it does so today. Before the treaty was created, President Kennedy feared, and he was very articulate about this, but many others as well around the world feared that the number of states with nuclear weapons would grow at an exponential rate with incalculable risks of catastrophic nuclear confrontation. The Non-Proliferation Treaty stemmed the tide of proliferation and today the complementary and reinforcing pillars of the treaty, nuclear disarmament, nuclear non-proliferation, and peaceful nuclear uses, they bring important benefits to all of the parties of the NPT system. Now, as of September 2013, the number of nuclear weapons in the active U.S. arsenal has fallen to 4,804. So that's from 31,000 down to just under 5,000. It's a big drop over the last 50 years. This newly declassified number represents an 85% reduction in the U.S. nuclear stockpile since 1967. It is indisputable that progress is being made toward accomplishing the NPT's disarmament goals. However, I like to say that in some ways we've done the easy part. We've tackled the nuclear overhang of the Cold War and begun to, you know, bring that down and accomplish quite a bit in terms of bringing down the big overbuilding that took place during the years of the Cold War. But at lower numbers, the job will be tougher, both in policy and also in technical terms, and that's where your help, I think, really comes in. At, on the technical side, that is because the lower the number of nuclear weapons, the harder it will be to verify further reductions. For example, in the past we focused on eliminating nuclear weapons on big delivery vehicle systems, big missiles or bombers, things that you could even see from outer space. The idea was eliminate the missile and you eliminate the threat of the warhead. Who cares if it goes off into a storage facility somewhere? That, that's fine. We'll just focus on getting the number of delivery vehicles down. But in today's world, we are worried that terrorists will get their hands on nuclear weapons, so we have to reduce and eliminate those weapons, even if they're hidden away in storage. That is a big challenge for a nuclear arms controller. How can we monitor the warheads, know where they are, and that the other guys don't have hidden stashes somewhere? And how can we monitor the warheads at these most sensitive of facilities? The Russians don't like the thought of us coming into their nuclear storage facilities even more, any more than we like the thought of them coming into ours. And then when you add in the other nuclear weapon states, China, UK, France, and you think about the nuclear weapon states that are not signatories of the NPT, particularly I'm wrestling quite a bit these days with India and Pakistan. Pr Prime Minister Modi's just been in Washington the last couple of days, so again, our business very much on the agenda in these high-level meetings. But how do you wrestle with these issues among a community of nuclear weapon states who are concerned about preserving and protecting sensitive information? 
So the challenges are very great, but at the same time, we need to be focused on the core of the problem, and this is the one that President Obama pointed to in his famous Prague speech in April of 2009. That is, if terrorists get their hands on nuclear weapons or fissile material, all bets are off. It's a terrible threat because we do not have the protective covering that deterrence policy provided us during the, the Cold War. How do we deter the unpredictable terrorist threat? So when you turn then to fissile material, to bomb-making material, the challenges only increase. The stuff is portable, easy to hide. Major ports now have radiation detectors, but these systems are very sensitive and can pick up radioactivity coming from a number of different types of products. Do you know that uh, toilets give off a lot of radiation, as do bananas? So um, you don't know unless you go and look what is inside these containers. And we're, of course, looking at ports that are handling millions of containers every week. For biological and chemical agents, the main problem comes from the dual-use nature of the work and the technologies. How can we tell if work being done is good or bad? Or if we cannot, how do we build in activities to reassure people, to safeguard the activity, and to reassure the international community that the work being done is safe and peaceful? So our goal is to devise and enhance systems for tracking and monitoring, as well as devise new ways to verify compliance with future agreements and treaties. Of course, as you who work in technology know, no system is ever 100% foolproof. To paraphrase Douglas Adams, foolproof systems tend to underestimate the ingenuity of complete fools, and for that matter, highly motivated cheaters. So, I like to turn to Paul Nitze, one of the greatest experts in the nonproliferation arena, a brilliant and esteemed national security expert who also turned his talents to diplomacy in this particular arena. He explained the notion of effective verification, which is really the, the kind of policy approach we work under. Nitze said, and I quote, if the other side moves beyond the limits of a treaty in any militarily significant way, we should be able to detect such militarily significant violations in time to respond effectively and thereby deny the other side the benefit of the violation. This definition has been much on my mind, as you can imagine, as we've grappled with the issue of Russian compliance with the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty in recent months. So this idea of effective verification. Nitsi's definition has been and continues to be the benchmark for verifying arms control treaties. But the world is changing, and as I've described, with it come new technologies that will, I believe, help us to monitor and verify arms control treaties and agreements. New information tools are popping up everywhere, and their potential impact is magnified by the global connectivity of the Internet. Our new reality is a smaller, increasingly networked world where the average citizen connects to other citizens in cyberspace hundreds of times each day. Today, any event anywhere on the planet could be broadcast globally in a matter of seconds. That means it's harder to hide things. When it's harder to hide things, it's easier to be caught. As I like to say, the neighborhood gaze is a powerful tool, and it can help us to verify the treaties and agreements that we have created and that we will create in the future. The way that we at the State Department see it so far there are uh, perhaps three ways to go about using the advances of the information revolution. And knowing already what I've learned this morning from talking to experts here at Georgia Tech, I figure you might come up with some more categories. So I hope our discussion can tease some of this out. But first of all, I look at the potential of having tools for inspectors. It's already apparent that digital tools are revolutionizing the way diplomacy is conducted, much like the telegraph did in the 19th century. Email is a good example. When I worked on the START negotiations in 1990 in Geneva, email did not exist. Everything was sent back to Washington in a very slow-moving way via, wow, remember fax machines? Some of you have probably never had to operate one, but that was an important innovation in 1990, believe it or not, the fax machine. But today we have email, and it speeds up the process of uh, conducting diplomacy in this area. Information technologies, however, could also be useful in the hands of inspectors. 
smartphone and tablet apps could be created for the express purpose of aiding in the verification and monitoring process. For example, by having all the safeguards and verification sensors in an inspected facility wirelessly connected through the cloud to an inspector's tablet, he or she could note anomalies and flag specific items for closer inspection, as well as compare readings in real time and then interpret them in context. This is really important because inspections are time limited. An inspector doesn't have all day, sometimes to cover a vast facility. And so to have some sensor readings as he or she goes in and be able to prioritize where he goes or uh, she goes in conducting the inspection could be extraordinarily useful. So tools for inspectors, that's category number one. Category number two, ubiquitous sensing, the use of big data. The second way we could incorporate new tools in the information of the information age include weapons of mass destruction uh, in weapons of mass destruction verification and monitoring is by harnessing the power of crowd generated data and then analyzing it. Already critical information generated through social networking is being incorporated into local safety systems in the United States. Sound far fetched to extend such an idea to arms control? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. There are apps that can convert your smartphone camera into a radiation detector and you know that uh, Japanese young people are already mapping the radiation around the Fukushima power plant area and feeding it into a national system in order to help uh, their government understand the aftermath of that disaster. So I think that there are many ways that we can be thinking about using uh, the products of uh, the information revolution in this way. And uh, the other area that I like to talk about is the use of the accelerometers that are already in your uh, tablet devices. They tell which way uh, is up for the tablet. But if you can network all the signals coming from those uh, accelerometers together, it would give you a sense of seismic activity. Now, in some cases, in most cases, the vast majority of cases, that seismic activity would be, of course, a naturally occurring event, an earthquake. But in some cases, it could be an illicit nuclear test. And therefore, it could give some early warning to be looking at particular places in the world where an illicit nuclear test is taking place. Of course, then you have to use other sources of information to analyze the data and to come to your conclusions. But that's a point I wanted to make. Nothing I think that emerges from the information uh, revolution can be used on its own. It must be put together with other sources of information, other sources of, um, of data, and of course, really good experienced analysis to make sense. Finally, I wanted to turn to the notion of societal verification. I know there's been a lot of folks working uh, on that here at Georgia Tech. I think it's a very exciting area. That is the notion of partnership between government and citizens in order to help to verify and monitor treaties and agreements. People throw up their hands and say, how could this ever be possible in the arms control realm? I always argue it's already very well accepted, very well accepted in the environmental arena where a lot of work goes on uh, both at local and regional levels, but also up to the national level in terms of sharing information. I think the example of the Gulf oil spill of a couple years ago where local environmental groups were able to enlist citizens to be feeding data from the beaches in the Gulf back into centralized systems to help to map where the pollution was occurring. All of this very well established at this point. So how do we think about using some of these same um, approaches in the arms control and non-proliferation safeguards arenas? So those are some of the exciting ideas I think that we have to pursue and I know again a lot of you have already been thinking about this stuff but what are the hitches that we have to address? The hitches we have to address are significant and they have to do with technical, legal, and political issues. Even diplomatic barriers, I wonder about how some of these things can be negotiable. And thinking about this, it reminds me of a trip I took to Moscow a couple years ago to present some of these same ideas at a much earlier phase in my own thinking. And I talked to a group of students at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. And after I went through and talked about this issue, this set of issues, a hand shot up. A very intelligent young man got up and he said, well, this is all very well and good, but I can tell you one thing for sure. My government will never 
ever accept the authority and legitimacy of data coming off of somebody's iPhone or iPad. They will want control, total control, of uh, the source of information, the national technical means, for example. Overhead satellites, fine. But somebody's iPad, no. So that's, I think, a big question for this community, and it is one that I would welcome the chance to pursue with you further. How do you take information coming off from these dispersed platforms and make it into a source of authoritative information for use in policymaking by governments? The flip side of that, of course, is how do you protect the individuals in societies where uh, the information revolution isn't embraced with so much enthusiasm as it is here in the United States. We see it as a general good, but for many people around the world in places like China and Russia and elsewhere, there's a wide degree of suspicion in the national governments and attempts to crack down and clamp down on this kind of information. So there are many questions, as I say, about how you would generalize the use of uh, this kind of technology and the, these kinds of data sources, but I welcome the chance to pursue these ideas with you further and to uh, wrestle them to the ground because I am convinced it can help us with the big problems we have today. Smaller and smaller items of account like warheads and the necessity of pursuing process monitoring as we go forward. We are going to need to understand when fissile material is being produced uh, illegally, for example. We are going to need to understand when and how chemical weapons are being produced illicitly. So these are some of the challenges that have been with us for a while, but now I think we have some of the technology that can help us to resolve them. So with that, I will um, turn the floor over to you, and uh, perhaps, Senator Nunn, are you willing to make a few comments, or no? No. All right. <laughs> very good, sir. Thank you very much again for being here. It's a, a real pleasure to see you. So in that case, I'll just throw the floor open to questions and, and do my best to answer them. But thank you very much for this opportunity today. Thank you. Yes, I saw a hand back there. Question. Please. Uh, I, to, uh, I want to ask you a question about non-proliferation. Non I, uh, I don't think the mic's on. It is. It's, uh, it's going to the video. So we're okay. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. OK, um, about the approach to the non-proliferation so far. So far, NPT has the approach that, oh, nobody else should have it no more, while those who have it, they are taking their own sweet time to reduce it. And the um, unfortunate thing is it is against the human nature for those who don't have it, they want to get in too for their safety. So have we ever considered reversing the course? That means first having the agreement and inspection and monitoring mechanism and then starting top down. That means the one who has the maximum starts lowering to the next level, then those two start going down to the third level, like that, so that everybody hits the zero at the same time. That may be more in line with human nature. Well, thank you, and you are describing precisely uh, the structure of the nonproliferation treaty regime, which actually flowed out of the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, in uh, the early 1960s. It produced a reaction. I mean, honestly, when you look at what I, I talked about, the overbuilding that went on during the Cold War, where we produced 31,000 nuclear weapons, and the Soviets produced, uh, according to some accounts anyway, coming out of Russia, 45,000 nuclear weapons. So we, at the outset, had to do a great deal between the two of us of reduction and limitation, and that process started immediately after the NPT was uh, signed in 1968 with the negotiation of the first strategic arms limitation talks uh, agreement. However, I have to say that that uh, first series of agreements, uh, they were pretty much a rank failure because of the modernization of technology that was going on and particularly the ability to deliver multiple warheads uh, from a single missile, the so-called MIRV technology. And that burst on the scene in the 1970s into the 1980s and resulted in this vast deployment 
of nuclear warheads on very powerful missiles. But luckily, I think over the last uh, really 20 years, we've had great success in bringing those numbers down. And the other area we've had great success is actually uh, eliminating warheads because that's the other piece of the problem, you know, if you've gotten rid of the missiles, fine, but somebody could decide to build more missiles once again if you've got the warheads stashed somewhere waiting to be put on missiles again. So one of the great, I think, unsung victories of these years since the end of the Cold War was the way we engaged in a, a highly enriched uranium purchase agreement with the Russian Federation under which we've eliminated the equivalent of 20,000 warheads from the former Soviet arsenal. So the numbers have been coming down steadily. I know there's a lot of disenchantment in some quarters saying, why can't you move even faster? Why can't you get down to zero even faster than you have been doing? And my argument in that case is uh, that we need um, now to move on to the next phase to enable moving to lower levels. And I'm not saying we're halting and sitting on our, on our hands waiting for that to happen. We're trying to push forward with the Russians. The Russians haven't been too enthusiastic lately. But our offer that was made in Berlin last summer by President Obama to uh, undertake an up to one-third further reduction in operationally deployed warheads would bring the number of US and Russian uh, deployed nuclear warheads down to approximately 1,000. So that's, again, a big drop from where we were during the Cold War. But we need some enablers technologically to get down closer and closer to zero. And of course, as always, we need uh, progress on the regional front to create the conditions politically for that kind of leap of faith, so to say, to get rid of nuclear weapons uh, completely. And uh, nowhere is that uh, more in evidence than I think than in South Asia today. So it's, it's a very good point that a lot of work has to be done on the peace building front too before we can imagine getting to zero nuclear weapons. So I yeah, just, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna ask, could you please introduce yourself, say your name and your affiliation when you ask a question? Okay. William Foster from the Mellon Institute in New York City. Um, as you may be aware, for the past 10 years, the Chinese Academy of Science has, has analyzed hundreds of millions of posts a day in real time to track um, things, th th everything from epidemics to demonstrations to aberrant behavior in the society. Um, where do you see the level, where do you see the best place to coordinate with China on using cyber? Is it best at a sort of level one government to government relationship? And I guess m my concern is most people in the U.S. government are concerned of losing their top secret clearances if they cooperate at a very deep level with China. Or is it more at a 1.5 level of former government officials or is it at an academic level? Thanks. Well, I think we have to do uh, all. Um, and frankly, of course, you know, no government official can cooperate with any other government around the world unless it's uh, specifically agreed to and authorized by his own, his or her own government. So that's just the reality of the situation. In which case, if it's fully authorized, there should be no danger to any top secret clearances. But anyway, that's, that's important enough, yeah. yes, exactly. So the questions then get to how can we effectively make progress? And my view is it's across all three fronts. So it's important to have good official contacts, government to government. It's important for the academic communities to get together at the so-called track two level where you, know, you have important opportunities, in my view, to make uh, some real advances where uh, governments in e either Washington or Beijing or any other capital around the world may not be quite ready to step out on a particular direction of policy. But track two can help to identify new ideas, can help to identify new possibilities, and where there may be doors starting to be pushed open in a particular capital. So I really am a big supporter of track two. And then I think track one and a half is a very important middle ground where we have academic experts coming together with some official representatives working together in this kind of, uh, of uh, setting. I think that can be very valuable as well. So I'm a big supporter across the board. I know sometimes uh, you hear government officials saying, oh, no, don't bring me those track two experts. I don't want to talk to them. But, you know, I've spent my career in and out of government. I'm a political appointee. I'm not, you know, a career government person. So I really think it's valuable 
to have uh, to really do all three, uh, whether it's official track two or track one and a half. Thanks. Yeah, I'm Neil. <coughs> oh, I'm Neil Shulman, and uh, with Emory University was in medicine and also movie making, Doc Hollywood. Uh, but I, we put on an event at the university called a Global Humanitarian Summit, or Health, where anybody could come who was doing things to make the world a better place. Food, shelter, health care, peace. The richest man from Kuwait who built the, uh, helped us with Katrina, sitting next to a drug dealers out of jail, working with kids with drug problems. And I wonder whether another peace movement <laughs> could be to set up a website, and Georgia Tech is an ideal place, where people all over the world can connect based and cluster based on these things. Because there are people in every country who do things like this and are humanitarian, but we cluster together by country and then kill strangers. And I wonder whether there would be any hope if we began to try to get to cluster together by these other humanitarian efforts? Well, that actually is a very important uh, other aspect of the work that I am trying to do in my position as the Under Secretary for Arms Control. I'm really the only senior government official who has, you know, arms control in her name. That's what I do full time. My colleagues, hugely respected, very good very good partners in the work we're trying to do, but they've got a wide spectrum of issues that they have to tackle. So I have to think broadly about where we need to go with arms control policy, and one area is precisely that, that we need to enrich and enliven the communities that have been working these issues for so many years, all uh, extremely dedicated, but um, sometimes not uh, perhaps forming the links to the new generation, forming the links to younger people that, that we need to see, and sometimes needing to reach out beyond their kind of traditional community to a broader community to make a difference uh, on a particular policy. One area that I've been working on very actively and trying to think about this and trying to think about how to broaden and enrich the networks is the area of ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. This treaty, uh, and Senator Nunn will remember this perhaps painfully, but it came up for a vote in the Senate in 1999. At that point, the Senate refused to give its advice and consent for ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Uh, at the time, the senators gave two reasons. They said, first of all, we are not convinced of the verifiability of the treaty. You say you're going to build an international system to monitor the treaty. We, we have no idea if it's going to work or not. And the second issue they brought up has had to do with whether we could set aside explosive nuclear testing forever and depend upon so-called science-based stockpile stewardship. Also at that point back in 1999, the whole concept of science-based stockpile stewardship was brand new. So now 15 years have gone by and we have answered those questions. We have a very capable international monitoring system based at the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization in, uh, in Vienna, and it is already doing very important work, for example, on tsunami warning. Or after the Fukushima power plant accident, it tracked the movement of the radio radiation uh, around the globe. So it's already doing important work and feeding data into important scientific uh, projects. The second area, though, science-based stockpile stewardship also has proven its mettle in the past 15 years, and I think we have a very good story to tell about how we are in a better place depending on science-based stockpile stewardship than we would be if we depended on nuclear explosive testing. But now comes the big heavy lift. The heaviest lift of all is how do you reignite public interest in this important treaty. Back when the treaty came up for the advice and consent of the Senate, 85% of the American public said, let's go for it. Let's ratify this treaty. So there was strong public support for the treaty at the time, but there were, I think, important questions that needed to be answered. So I'm glad we've been able to answer them in the past 15 years. But now we need to develop, again, 
that level of grassroots interest and support at a time when nuclear weapons, now not for you folks here at Georgia Tech, weapons of mass destruction are your daily diet <laughs> for good or for ill, but for, you know, I would say the vast population of the United States, they never think about these things. So how do we spark people's interest, get them engaged and involved, and wanting to help, you know, push the issue so that it uh, can be I think brought to a level of attention in, in Washington as well. So it's an important challenge and I absolutely agree that some of the tools we now have available could be very, very helpful and they have burst on the scene since 1999. So uh, we need to figure out how best, how best to use them. Thank you. Please. Peter Brecky, Sam Nunn School of International Affairs. The question I have for you is somewhat based off of the one Will did earlier. And with respect to the third of the three legs that you mentioned earlier for moving forward, the tying in the public to the verification efforts, you know, through our smartphones and stuff like that, what are your thoughts or preferences or advice that you have been given by others with respect to who should do that? Would it be like some university group that develops the apps that then get distributed through, you know, the app stores of the different smartphones? Should it be some non-governmental organization that maybe takes over from a university team? Or should it be some international organization like, you know, the UN or some umbrella thing under it? I'm open to all comers, <laughs> frankly, whatever works best. And I have been working uh, also with uh, people in Silicon Valley directly with the industry to try to get them interested. We just had a really good meeting out at Stanford, um, let's see, it's now uh, two and a half weeks ago, where we had uh, part good participation from across Silicon Valley um, uh, companies and uh, innovators there, and they, they were kind of Hmm, what is this nuclear stuff? So it was something new for them, but at the same time they were interested in how what they're doing can uh, apply to this area of policy. I'll tell you a very funny vignette though, which was a lot of them do think in terms of dollars and cents, so their immediate question was, well, how are we going to monetize this? And I said, are you kidding me? You can't monetize when you're working on a <laughs> diplomatic problem of this kind you do it for the larger, uh, the greater good, the greater good. Uh, and I have to say, uh, to be fair, we had quite a lively discussion of that and there were many, many around the room who understood the notion of the, you know, this, this greater good and that we need to be willing to work um, sometimes on projects that, that support that. But in answer to your question, I'm open to uh, any uh, approach and I welcome the chance, as I said earlier, to work with the academic community on, on trying to make some of these ideas become a practical reality. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Ryan Hansen. I'm a student here at the graduate program. Um, I have a question regarding South Korea as they kind of develop into a major player in the civil nuclear energy market and start to really distribute these technologies around the world. They also lack the enrichment programs that could be used to produce fuel to couple with these sales. I'm kind of curious as they ramp the program up in sales, is the U.S. position on domestic enrichment in Seoul, is that evolving at all? Is that position changing within the U.S. government? You know, our position has always been that um, there is uh, an international and should be an uh, international aspect to this marketplace that no um, individual country or, or player participant in the marketplace has to or should necessarily control uh, all the pieces of it. So I would just say our longstanding policy has been to uh, depend on the international marketplace for uh, enrichment and reprocessing repro capabilities. I'm actually very glad, and, and many American companies are participating uh, with the South Koreans in uh, their reactor sales activities and uh, will continue to do so. But I don't kind of buy the, the basic uh, premise that uh, an individual country, whether it's South Korea or any other country, has to control the entire fuel cycle. So I think we should and we must actually, for economic reasons, for non-proliferation policy reasons and uh, perhaps uh, just for some common sense reasons, we need to depend on the marketplace in this regard. You look puzzled. You want to come back? You can have one if you want one. 
I've, I've just always seen the U.S. position as kind of hesitant with South Korea enriching just because of the geopolitical relationship with their neighbors. So I was wondering if you could address that at all. Uh, no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, missiles that were declassified. Yes. So I'm assuming more they have more heads, because actually. I can't imagine 100% you know, uh, declassification. Um, uh, the other is how many more are necessary to be declassified at the moment? Because I'm sure there would be more than that 4,000 or 5,000. The other is uh, with the improvement in uh, technology and refinement and sophistication, I assume that the destructive capacity is maybe a thousand times what you started with, what was started with in terms of TNT. Uh, maybe there were, that was, you may have reduced the warheads, but the destructive capacity may have increased about a thousand times. Uh, the other thing is because of the dissemination of the research and development to private corporations, colleges, universities. You know, how do you monitor that when it's so far out of your hands? Yes, those are all very good questions. Um, I would uh, stress that the number that has been declassified so far uh, is uh, this 4808 number is a number of operationally uh, deployed uh, warheads, warheads that are in the so-called active stockpile. So, you are quite right that there are other warheads that are held in reserve, um, and uh, most many of those are, you know, essentially going into a queue for elimination. And it does take time to take apart warheads. People get. Uh, we had an earlier qu question. Your neighbor had an earlier question about why it's taking so long. It takes a long time because it takes a long time to uh, take apart warheads uh, safely and securely, and to ensure that. <clears throat> all of the components are properly disposed of. I was just out in Los Alamos last week and looking at how they, you know, basically it's it's a hand by hand process. You can't just take a big uh, take a big sledgehammer and bring it down on them. You have to take them apart bit by bit. So um, it is a long process, but I can assure you that it is a process that will continue to go forward. And so this number will be a rolling number and as time goes by I will expect to continue to see that that number to go to go lower and we will see what other countries are willing to do so far we have been the most transparent and open of any of the nuclear weapon states about how many warheads that we have uh, in our active stockpile and we'll see we continue pressing the other states to be more open themselves but that's that's a goal going forward um, in terms of um, you know how how we move this process forward uh, with uh, other nuclear weapon states, again, it is a very slow process. Uh, we put in place back in 2010 during the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in 2010, we put in place a so-called P5 process, which is supposed to slowly but surely bring all of the P5 around uh, the table, not necessarily for the uh, purpose of disarmament negotiations to begin with, but to make sure that everyone is acquainted with the basic issues and concepts of strategic stability, acquainted with the history and uh, the progress of arms control and reduction so far, and acquainted with some of the technical challenges of uh, verifiably reducing uh, and eliminating uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, frankly, I think it has uh, done a lot over the past five years to develop a good working relationship among the P5. Again, that's UK, France, United States, China, and Russia. But there are big barriers today. And one of the biggest barriers in my mind as the person responsible for working this policy day in, day out, is right now the attitude of the Russian Federation. Because the Russian Federation have announced publicly that they are done with bilateral nuclear arms reduction. They have said it is time to move on to multilateral reductions. We are not coming back to the negotiating table with the United States of America. We need 
China, UK, and France at the table with us. And to my mind, that is really premature because we and the Russian Federation still have uh, about 90% of the nuclear weapons in the world. And so there is still more work that we can do between the two of us to bring our numbers down. As I said, the Berlin proposal would bring our numbers of deployed weapons down to approximately 1,000 on each side. And to my mind, you know, uh, that's a period when we can begin talking about uh, more uh, active uh, multilateral disarmament processes. But in the meantime, we are trying to, you know, carry out this P5 activity to, to get the other countries used to the idea of being involved in uh, disarmament negotiations more actively. So that's the goal. We'll see how it uh, is carried forward and we'll see how it goes because the NPT review conference is coming up again every five years it takes place this spring uh, in uh, May. 2015, and I hope, I hope it will be successful, but with the Russians saying yet at the moment, and we're done, and we're waiting for China and UK and France to come to the table, I think it is going to be a difficult review conference. So we'll see how it goes. You have been speaking uh, to various groups over some period yes, it's fine. over some period of time regarding societal verification as we talked about earlier today who else from the discussions you've had should we be talking to about trying to move this forward for example to, to have some you know university team led development of these apps that I mentioned earlier and stuff like that you know I I don't know and I would think that you would probably know better than anyone well, I think um, continuing to talk to me is a good idea, for one thing. <laughs> but uh, honestly, um, I think that you know, there's a, a group in Washington now, uh, at the, it's the Verification Technology Group, uh, who works in the Bureau of Arms Control under my aegis. They have been the ones who have been most actively involved in thinking through how we you know, bring these ideas closer, closer to fruition. I think there are also uh, opportunities to continue to engage in projects of the kind that NTI did on societal verification. That was a very powerful project with some very, very uh, powerful results and it's been widely uh, briefed now among government players. And so there are other pockets of interest in this around the government. It's DOE and NSA and the group there. There's DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and the group there. So frankly, we ought to figure out how to maybe put together a little bit of a consortium to have some more active discussion of how to bring these ideas to fruition. Because I've tried some ideas over the last couple of years. We've had a couple of, uh, of competitions, for example, to try to pull together ideas and to get uh, people generating some new ideas about how to, to use the information technology tools. But frankly, it's the old conundrum, which I've confronted many times in my career, and I know many around the room have. How do you get some bright idea that's on the drawing boards into first a prototype and then into the marketplace and into the hand of a user? And to, in the first instance, you have to interest a user. There we come back to the questions I raised in my remarks about negotiability and uh, about ensuring that we've been able to answer some of these questions about the authority and legitimacy of the information. And on the flip side of that, legalities of using information that's generated off of, uh, of uh, private uh, sources like iPhones or iPads. So a lot of issues still to be confronted, but I would welcome an opportunity to, to accelerate some of these discussions so we can get to the practical point of putting some tools, for example, into the hands of inspectors. I think that would be a great, great way forward. So thank you. Please. On the question of societal verification, uh, Rose mentioned that we at NTI have had three different panels, and one of them has been on societal verification. And what we've done is we've had groups, this is all track, I'd say, what, one in three quarters. We've had a lot of governmental people involved in it around the world but what we have tried to do is get an international group of people working on that uh, and uh, we have published several reports on that. Corey Henderstein has headed that up. She's now about to go over for two years with the Department of Defense 
But one of the things we've also em emphasized, not just in societal verification, but other uh, verification uh, 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 subjects, and that is trying to get countries who do not have nuclear weapons to also be part of the process, because those countries are the have-not countries as they see it, and they've never been part of the process, so that has two disadvantages. One is they don't trust the process, and number two, they don't understand how hard it is. And they don't understand, if they don't understand it, it's very hard to really uh, have success in things like the renewal of nonproliferation treaty and all those things. So we're trying to get a much broader group of, of actors together and have done extensive work, which is all available and been pu publicized on societal as well as several other of the components of verification. Let me finally say one other word. Rose Goddard-Miller is one of the finest public servants I've ever known, and she is absolutely terrific. So we're lucky to have her here. And uh, our, our, our country is very fortunate to have her. She not only did all the things Adam said in, in an introduction, but she also headed up Carnegie uh, Endowment in uh, Moscow for how many years? Three years. Three years. So she knows the Russians very, very well. And that's one of the values of the whole arms control process that people don't think about, particularly those who dismiss arms control and say forget it. There are relationships and uh, are developed and it trust that is developed between individuals from the United States and Russia that have enormous effect over the years. And when you dismiss it altogether, you are taking away one of the most powerful uh, builders of trust that we've ever had. And of course, right now, we're at a very low ebb of trust between our governments, but there are still our relationships. There are people that Rose deals with in Russia. She wouldn't say this, might get her in trouble on Capitol Hill in some quarters, but they would trust her when she uh, says something. They would know that she's telling them what she really thinks and what she believes. And I'm sure there are probably a few unnamed Russians you'd put in that category too. So that's a very valuable part of the process. So Rose, just let me thank you for being here and Adam for putting together a great program. All of you for coming. Before we close, let me uh, herald some of the unsung heroes that made this event possible. One of them is Jeremiah Grandin, who really helped it so that all of you could be here, uh, as is the case with Mary Lou Suarez. But I also want to thank Alex Bell uh, for making sure uh, Undersecretary Godmuller is here. So with that, please join me in thanking uh, under the Undersecretary for joining us today. Thank you.